Welcome to a lesson on the Central Limit Theorem for Sample Means. The Central Limit Theorem, or CLT for short, is one of the most powerful and useful ideas in all of statistics. There are two alternative forms of the theorem, and both alternatives are concerned with drawing finite samples size n from a population with a known mean mu and a known standard deviation sigma. The first alternative says that if we collect samples of size n with a large enough n, calculate each sample's mean, and create a histogram of those means, the resulting histogram will tend to an approximate normal bell-shaped curve or a normal distribution. The second alternative says that if we again collect samples of size n that are large enough, calculate the sum of each sample, and create a histogram, then the resulting histogram will again tend to a bell-shaped curve or a normal distribution. The size of the sample n that is required in order to be large enough depends on the original population from which the samples are drawn. The sample size should be at least 30 or the data should come from a normal distribution. If the original population is far from normal, then more observations are needed for the sample means or sums to be normal. Sampling is done with replacement. It will be difficult to overstate the importance of the central limit theorem in statistical theory. Knowing that data, even if its distribution is not normal, behaves in a predictable way is a powerful tool. Suppose x is a random variable with a distribution that may be known or unknown. Using a subscript that matches the random variable, Suppose mu sub x equals the mean of x and sigma sub x is equal to the standard deviation of x. If you draw random samples of size n, as n increases, the random variable x bar, which consists of sample means, tends to be normally distributed, indicated using this notation here, where the mean of x bar is mu sub x and the standard deviation of x bar is equal to the standard deviation of x divided by the square root of n. Where again, mu sub x is the average or mean of both x and x bar, and sigma sub x bar, again, is equal to sigma sub x, the standard deviation of x, divided by the square root of n, where n is the sample size. And sigma sub x bar is called the standard error of the mean. Also notice how as n increases, the denominator of sigma sub x bar increases, and therefore sigma sub x bar decreases. The central limit theorem for sample means says if you keep drawing larger and larger samples and calculating their means, the sample means form their own normal distribution, which is called the sampling distribution. The normal distribution has the same mean as the original distribution and a variance that equals the original variance divided by the sample size. The standard deviation is the square root of the variance, so the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is the standard deviation of the original distribution divided by the square root of n, given by the notation shown here at the top. The variable n is the number of values that are averaged together, not the number of times the experiment is done. To put it more formally, if you draw random samples of size n, the distribution of the random variable x bar, which consists of the sample means, is called the sampling distribution of the mean. The sampling distribution of the means approaches a normal distribution as n, the sampling size, increases. The random variable x bar has a different z-score associated with it from that of the original variable x. The mean small x bar is the value of big X bar in one sample. So the z-score is equal to X bar minus mu sub X divided by the quotient of sigma sub X and the square root of N, which is equivalent to X bar minus mu sub X divided by sigma sub X bar. Remember, sigma sub X bar is equal to this quotient here in the denominator. To better understand this, let's look at an animation. In this animation, the first graph is the parent population, the second graph is the sample data, and the third graph is the distribution of the means. So as we take more and more samples, 
we should begin to see the distribution of the means approach a normal distribution. For this example, let's go ahead and select a sample size of 25. I know earlier we said we should have a sample size of at least 30, but this animation only goes to a maximum sample size of 25, which should be enough. So at the top here we can select a variety of distributions. We have a normal distribution, a uniform distribution, a skewed distribution, as well as we can make a custom distribution. And again, regardless of the distribution of the population, as we find the means of each sample and then plot the distribution of the means, we should begin to see a normal distribution for the distribution of means. So let's find one sample from the parent population which has a skewed distribution. So here we see the 20 samples being drawn. I'm sorry, 25 samples. And at the bottom we have the first mean of the first sample. Let's go ahead and do that again. So here's the second sample. And now we'll go ahead and speed this up. Let's go ahead and find five samples. Five more. Let's try 10,000 more, 10,000 more, 10,000 more, and so on. Notice right now we've taken 50,012 samples. And notice the distribution of the means does look like a normal distribution or a bell-shaped curve, which we can see here. And this is the idea behind the central limit theorem. Also notice how the mean of the parent population and the mean of the distribution of means are the same. The standard deviations are different because remember, to find the standard deviation for the distribution of the means, we take the standard deviation of the population and divide by the square root of n, which in this case would be the square root of 25 or 5. Now let's look at a different parent population. Let's try a uniform distribution. Let's go ahead and find one sample. And let's go ahead and increase the number of samples by 10,000 several times. We can quickly see how the distribution of the means is approaching a normal distribution or a bell-shaped curve, which is indicated by the central limit theorem. And now let's do this one more time. Let's create our own custom distribution for the parent population, maybe something like this. Again, regardless of this distribution, the distribution of the means should approach a normal distribution. So let's go ahead and find one sample of 25. And now let's increase the number of samples by let's say five at a time. We can really see the development of the normal distribution for the distribution of the means. Let's increase it by 10,000 now. And we can really see how the distribution of the means is approaching a normal distribution. And once again, notice how the mean of the population and the mean of the distribution of means is almost the same. The standard deviations are different because remember to find the standard deviation of the distribution of means, we take the standard deviation of the population and divide by the square root of n which in this case is the square root of 25, which is equal to five. So notice how the standard deviation of the distribution of means is much smaller than the standard deviations of the population. The content from this lesson has been adapted from the introductory statistics textbook from OpenStax, and the animation of the central limit theorem is from onlinestatbook.com, and here is the direct link. I hope you found this helpful.